Hello and welcome to the Science Month, which is organized by ISA Kolkata Campus Radio and the Science Club. And today is the third talk in this first week, which is presented by a very special speaker who has joined in from Colombia. Now I'll pass it on to Anaka, who is a first year student in ISA Kolkata, who will introduce our speaker. Over to you, Anaka. A very warm welcome to all of you out there. This is the third talk of the Science Month organized by the Campus Radio and Science Club of ISA Kolkata. So today's talk will be delivered by Sarita Munoz Gomez on the title, How to Color a Sepal. So Sarita enrolled in the biology program at the University of Antioquia in 2014. While she was there, she joined the planned Evo Devo lab to develop her undergrad thesis under the monitoring of Natalia Pavon Mora. Last October, she graduated. Since then, she has been working on the manuscript on their work on the genes in Aristolochaceae that causes coloring of the sepals. So currently, she's applying for the grad schools in the United States to continue her research on the evolution and molecular basis of color in angiosperms. Also, she has been working on the fern mail an initiative on Twitter uh, to connect scientists around the world using cool illustrations. So this clearly shows uh, that she is very passionate about science communication. So it's a real privilege to welcome you, Sarita. And I hope our audience will have a wonderful time. Also, I wish, uh, also I humbly request the viewers to post their questions in the YouTube live chat. Over to you, Sarita. Thank you so much for the introduction. That was so nice. Um, I'm gonna start sharing my screen now. Okay. Um, I hope you all you can all see my screen right now. Yeah. Um, okay, awesome. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. I feel very honored to be here talking to you today. Um, I'll be talking about the R2 or three um, MIF genes in the Aristolochiasia and how they are related to the production of pigments in the perianth of these flowers. Um, these are actually the results of my undergrad thesis that was developed last year under the mentoring of Natalia Paul Mora. And it was, we worked in the plant Evodevo lab at the University of Antioquia in Colombia. Uh, but before uh, getting into my work, or our work, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about my background. So as you heard before, uh, I enrolled in the biology program at the University of Antioquia. Um, this is the university. It is located in the second largest city in Colombia, which is Medellin. Um, here are a few pictures of the biology department. 
um, yeah, we have a lot of species there. And as a timeline, I'm gonna go really fast with this, but uh, I graduated high school in 2014, in 2013, and then, then I enrolled in an exchange program um, in Canada and at the beginning of 2014. Later that year, I actually started in the biology program at the University of Antioquia, and I was hoping to become a microbiologist at first. Uh, when I was there, I had a few teaching assistant uh, jobs uh, in a few courses like evolution, genetics, and others. And then while I was an undergrad, somehow I realized that I like, I actually like the plants. So all my microbiology dreams uh, were left to the side. And after that realization, I joined the Plant Evo Lab in 2018. Uh, when I was there, I did my undergrad thesis. And a few years later, in 2020, last year, I graduated in October. And since then, I've been actually applying to grad school in the in the U.S. since I want to pursue a PhD. Um, my undergrad thesis is the work that I will be talking to you today. Um, I have presented this work in a few conferences and symposiums, such as the Colombian Conference of Evolutionary Biology in 2019, the Science Department to 2020 Symposium and Developmental Biology New York last year. And in between graduating and grad school applications and all the pandemic, I actually started the Fern Mail, which is an illustration initiative. So here's a few examples of what I do there. Um, you can follow the fern mail in, on Twitter if you want to. Uh, I Well, basically what I do is I draw uh, like stamps for different scientists. It's a way to create a community using art um, and social media. But I'm very passionate about illustration. So I have worked in a few PhD and master's theses doing illustrations. Um, I have made a few logos for labs, like the Evo Plant Evo Evo Lab and the Whitman Lab at uh, Arizona State University. Uh, I make a few drawings just for fun, and I collaborate uh, with the LBGT um, plant biologist Twitter uh, sometimes, so I make a few drawings for them too. Um, but I also wanted to share a little bit of what we do at the Plant Evo Evo Lab um, and what other members of the lab are doing right now, and what they are working on. So, as I said before, the, the lab is at the University of Antioquia. Here are a few pictures of the members. This is our PI, Natalia Pavon. Um, and here are the members that are currently and in the lab. Um, the lab works in many different families across the angiosperms and outside the angiosperms. Uh, here are a few families that I kind of put rows into, but I'm gonna go one by one, kind of fast, but so you can see a little bit of the, the projects. So outside the angiosperms, there are two projects, which are, here's Carolina Rodriguez. She's working on floral gene evaluation in reproductive transition uh, of neotropical fern species. So what she's doing right now is actually trying to understand what the um, genes for flowering are doing in other species that do not produce flowers, such as ferns. Um, Catherine is actually working in the anatomy changes that are suffered in the leaves of retrophilum uh, when resupination happens. So resupination is this cool mechanism in which uh, leaves of the plant kind of 
suffer a torsion. And for that to happen, many other anatomy changes need to happen. So she's gonna do that for her undergrad thesis. I forgot to mention that Carolina is a master, master's student and she will be graduating soon. Uh, Harold Suarez Baron was actually one of my mentors during my undergrad thesis. And he works trying to understand the molecular mechanisms that underlie the formation of floral trichomes in Aristolochia. Um, Aristolochia is an early diverging family of angiosperms. And trichomes are these really cool structures that are like hair-like, and you can find them in different parts of the plant. But he is actually studying the ones that are part of the flower of a few uh, species of the Aristolochiaceae. And Maria Alejandra is working in the Chlorantasia family. And she is trying to understand the anatomy and the evolution of cell fruits, such as this one in the Diosbum. Um, and there's a big project on orchids in the lab. Uh, three members of the lab are working or have worked in this project that tries to uh, evaluate the genes that control the transition from vegetative to reproductive phases in orchids. Um, here's Yesenia Madrigal. She's a PhD student right now. And she has actually located many of the genes that are related to this transition. And uh, the evolution of PEVP genes that are related to this trans transition too were evaluated for by Diego Spina during his undergrad thesis. And the AGL24 and SBP genes were evaluated by Andrea Ramirez in her undergrads too. They both graduated last year. We also have Sebastian Martinez. He works in, with the tropeolum uh, genera, which, and he tries to understand the development of the nectar spore, which is this really cool structure right here that gives the, the flower a bilateral symmetry. And finally, we have Hector Salazar. He graduated from his master's last year, and he was working in the evolution and the developmental patterns in the flowers, in the flower to fruit transition of different Rubiaceae species. So Rubiaceae is a very cool family, and many of the species are found here in Colombia, such as coffee and noni, which is a very popular fruit. And La Natalie Hernandez, she worked in the evolution and development of Solanaceae fruits during her undergrad thesis. She also graduated last year. And these Solanaceae species are also very popular around the world. And um, there are many species that belong to this family, such as the potato, uh, tomatoes, and peppers. If, you, if any of you are interested in knowing more about the lab or, or any of those projects or more projects that are going on right now, uh, you can visit the lab website. And if you want to contact any of the members of the lab or our PI, you can do it by going into the website. There's all the information for every member of the lab. Um, now I'm gonna talk to you about the, um, my undergrad thesis, which I, I named this talk, How to Color a Zeppel. Um, so I'm gonna go right in. As many of you may know, uh, floral organs are formed in a very specific order during development. So sepals are formed first, then petals, stamens, and carpels. And a flower can actually only have petals, only sepals, or it can have both. Sepals are usually green, as you can see here, and they protect the floral bud when this is young. And the petals are usually very colorful because they attract pollinators. But in the Aristolochiaceae family, most flowers 
actually are composed of only sepals and those sepals are not green. They are very, very colorful and can have patterns. This family comprises around 550 species and it belongs to the order Piperalis. The family is composed of six genera, which are Saruma, Asarum, Lactoris, Idnora, Totea, and Aristolochia. And the genera Aristolochia has around 450 species, is the largest genera inside the family, and their flowers are composed of sepals that fuse completely forming this kettle-like flower. There are three parts that are um, distinctive inside the flower, which are the limb, the elongated tube, and the inflated utricle. And as for color in the variant of the family, we have the flowers of Saruma Henry, which is the only species inside Saruma. And these flowers have sepals and petals. These are the only flowers. They have both petals and sepals inside the family. And the petals are yellow, while the sepals are green. Asylum has three sepals, and they are kind of purple, but they can be a little yellow too. Ipnora has three fleshy orange sepals. Totea has three sepals that are more fused together, and they are kind of dark purple. And then we have Aristolochia, in which flowers have three sepals that are completely fused together. And then we have this weird coloration with patterns formed by three distinctive colors, which are yellow, red, and purple across the whole period. The formation of pigments in angiosperms is related to molecules such as betalines, betalines, carotenoids, and flavonoids. Inside flavonoids, we find the anthocyanins, which produce colors such as red, pink, purple, and blue. In, and these colors can be found in different parts of the body of the plant. And the regulation of the production of flavonoids and anthocyanins, uh, it's made by transcription factors. In this case, by the R2R3 mid genes that can regulate many pathways um, and can be related to different functions, such as the specific a specialization of different cells to become root hairs or trichomes, or the regulation of pathways such as the anthocyanin pathway, as I said before. Um, in the species model Arabidopsis thaliana, there has been a distinction of subgroups inside the R2 or 3 mid genes. The subgroup 6 contains four genes that are thought to be related to the uh, um, regulation of these pathways that I mentioned before. And with that in mind, we wanted to know if the regulation of these pathways in the sepals of the Aristolochiasia was somehow similar to Arabidopsis. So to evaluate this, we used 11 different transcriptomes from 11 Aristolochiasia species. We included uh, four different genera inside the family, which are Saruma, Totea, Asarum, and many different species from the Aristolochia genera. So first, we wanted to do a phylogenetic approach. So what you're seeing here is our phylogenetic hypothesis, well, a part of it, and here in purple, you can see all the Aristolochiasis species evaluated. And we were able to identify one large uh, scale duplication that was before the um, diversification of Asarum and Saruma. And one small scale duplication here in red 
that occurred for the death in Posa. But what I want you to remember here is that actually most Aristolochiasia have only one homolog that corresponds or to the SG6. Um, so first we know that there are two or three meets six diversification in the angiosperms seems to be related to holding on and tendon duplications. Second, that increasing homolog numbers in Sarum and Asarum seems to be related to a larger genome uh, size that we think is due to a polyploidy event. But most importantly, is that there are, are two or three new genes in the Aristolochiasia family are mostly found as single copy. Then we wanted to evaluate the expression of the genes in a few uh, of, of the species of the family. And we choose this species based on the color of the perianth. So first we have Saruma henry, which has um, yellow petals. And we were able to see that actually one of the copies was expressed in sepals, green sepals, in the yellow petals and in the green leaves. But there was, in the second copy, there was expression of the petals in the petals and in the leaves, but not in the perianth. For the, for a certain canadiense, we found two copies. The first one was expressed in all of the developmental stages. So we found expression from the earliest to the last, which is antithesis, in which uh, sepals are already colored. The second copy was actually not found the expression was not found in any of the developmental stages. We also evaluated two uh, species inside the Aristolochia. So we evaluated Aristolochia manchuriensis in three different developmental stages. So for the first one, which is S2, the whole variant is green and we were able to find expression there. The second developmental stage was S9 and we evaluated the green limb, the reddish tooth, and the very dark purple utricle. And as you can see here, there was expression in the three parts of the perian. But for our thesis, where the limb is completely yellow and truly yellow, there was no expression of the gene. Leaves uh, had expression too. And for Aristolochia fimbriata, we evaluated actually two developmental stages. So the early one was S6, in which limb, tooth, and utricle were evaluated, but all three of them were completely green, and we were able to find expression of all of them, in all of them. And then we have evaluated S9, where you can, where we divided the flower in limb, tooth, and utricle again, and we were able to find expression of the gene in the dark purple limb and tooth, but not expression in the mostly yellow utricle. And there was expression in the leaves. So there are a few things that we can say about this. First, that the R2 or 3 gene expression in leaves seems to be related to a UV protection function. The second is that the activation of these genes actually seems to start very early in development, since when we evaluated early um, the stages in development, we always found that there was expression of the gene. Also, we think that expression of these genes in the flowers is usually visible when you have uh, very dark colors, such as uh, purple and red tissue, but it's usually absent when the tissue is yellow. And for the regulation of the flavonoid and anthocyanin pathways seems to be simplified in the Aristolochiasia, and it seems to be ancient since it's found in this early diverging family inside the ancient groups. Finally, we also wanted to evaluate the absence or presence of different enzymes 
that are part of the anthocyanin or flavonoid um, biosynthetic pathways. For that, we wanted to do it in an silico way. So we took our 11 transcriptomes and we translated them into peptides. So we could um, use the check database to find the absence and presence of the enzymes. So what you're seeing here is um, the both flavonoid uh, biosynthetic pathway and the start of the anthocyanin uh, pathway and all the all the enzymes that you can see colored in yellow are actually those that were found in the 11 transcriptomes that we evaluated for the aristolochiasis. The one that it's not coloring yellow and it's actually circled in orange is the one that we were not able to find for any of the species. And it makes sense because this enzyme just is the direct kind of way to synthesize the delphinin, which is actually the anthocyanin that produced uh, blue color. So we can say that uh, the absence of this enzyme is directly uh, directly uh, related to the absence of blue color in the Aristolochiasia because in this family you don't see blue color in the variant of any of the flowers. And second, that main flavonoid biosynthetic pathway enzymes seem to be conserved in the family. So I just wanted to finish the talk by saying saying that the early divergent Aristolochiasia family seems to be a really good and unique opportunity to study color in angiosperms in a very simplified way. And I just wanted to thank one last time my mentor Natalia Pavon and Harold Suarez and our collaborators Juan Fernando Alzate and Fabio Gonzalez and also uh, our funding sources, such as Harvard University, the Arnold Arboretum of Harvard University, the University of Dresden, uh, Centro Nacional de Sequenciación Genómica here in, in Medellín, and Colebot. And that is all. Thank you very much for listening. And in case you have any other questions, you can email me or you can find me on Twitter. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sarita, for this really interesting talk. And especially the presentation, as always, was really fantastic with all these hypnotic illustrations. And I really loved loved it. I mean, I can see why you love working with plants. So, <laughs> so, so, uh, so let's see if there are any questions and people are probably typing in. I have a few questions myself. So you uh, stated in your slides that uh, this gene, uh, 2 or 3 myb gene, uh, suggests uh, an UV ray protection function. So how did you guys figure this out? Uh, actually, it was, it's in the literature. So you, you can find a few um, examples of the UV protection um, in a few papers. Uh, they tried to uh, demonstrate that in a few ways. I know there's a paper that actually shows how um, if you cover an apple that it's in the early developmental stages when anthocyanins are still not uh, produced. Uh, she's going to not produce anthocyanins because she's covered, but once you uncover the apple, she's going to really fast to start producing the anthocyanins and that seems to be related to the sunlight. So, yeah, that's kind of an example. We think that if it, if they are present in leaves, you don't you don't you don't usually relate uh, leaves to a pollinator attraction function. So we think it's more a V and UV um, function. All right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that was a great answer. 
And next question is by Shritama, and they are asking, does R two three MYB gene show polygenic inheritance? Polygenic inheritance. Um, well, I don't know actually. Um, yeah, <laughs> but about the inheritance, I really don't know because that's not actually something that we evaluated. Um, I I don't. I haven't come across studies that try to understand that either, but I mean, I could try to find something and maybe we could discuss it later. Uh, maybe you can email me. Um, but yeah, right now I don't know. <laughs> Cool. So, uh, Shetama, if you want to know more about this, you can always reach out to her on Twitter or email her. And her ID was in the slides. So, the next question is uh, really interesting, and even I'm really curious about this: is how did you study uh, the gene expressions in lab? That is, how how are the experiments on plants actually carried out? Which is something we all are curious to know. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So, what we did here was we you actually um, ex do an RNA extraction from the tissue that you're interested and then uh, so RNA is not very stable um, so what we do is actually you, we do a treatment and then we we synthesize C DNA which is uh, two strand of DNA, and with that, we do PCR. So after you do the PCR, you can uh, do an, a, a gel electrophoresis, and you can watch the expression of the genes. Um, so it's very similar to what you're seeing here. You kind of see just the bands, and it was very straightforward because um, it was just if you see the the band, he, the gene is expressing. If you don't, it's absent. I don't know if that was clear enough. Yeah, I guess that was that was pretty good. And if you have any more doubts, then you can obviously reach out to her. The next question is by Omkar, and uh, he has two questions. The first question is, what exactly motivated you to take up interest in plants and Aristolosia in particular? Okay, awesome. Uh, in plants, I actually became very interested when I took the botany course uh, at the university. We had really good professors, and when I had to do the lab, uh, I really like the anatomy of the plants and how pretty they looked under the microscope. And it was just fascinating. The evolution of plants, everything was super great. And then I took an evil devil uh, curse, sorry. And that's when I met my mentor. And I really liked this kind of, this field in which you get to use very different tools to try to answer one specific question because um, you use like microscopy, anatomy, uh, bioinformatics, you do genetics, uh, so many different things. Um, and then I joined the lab and this lab actually is very focused on, uh, on understanding the genetics of Aristolochiasia. So I was offered to work with these plants and I started to read about them and the ecology of them. And I just think they're very, very cool. If, if you're interested in, in ecology, these plants are awesome. They 
Many people think they are carnivorous because of the ecology, because how they trap flies, but they are not. So it's very, very cool. And that's basically how I ended up working with Aristolochia, with Aristolochia, yeah. And yeah. <laughs> Great, and I personally love these flowers and these plants, they look wonderful. And he has another question, and the question is, uh, could you say anything about how the beautiful patterns on the sepals uh, come from, how the different patterns arise? Well, actually, we don't know, and I, I'm pretty sure they are not, they are not um, studies on the patterns, like look at this. Wait, I'm gonna shit. Like these patterns are so cool. But yeah, I don't think there are studies on Aristolochiasia about the patterns, but there are a few studies that I know in Mimulus, uh, and they try to understand how a few dots in the petals are formed. And it, the, the formation of those petals are actually related to me transcription factors too. And there's like a really good cool theory about how one uh, protein ha it has to move to the other cells and then it kind of inhibits the production of anthocyanins there and then it moves to other, another cell and inhibits the production there and that's how the patterns start to form. Um, in Aristolochiasia, what we have been able to kind of see is that patterns uh, sometimes follow the veins and um, we are not very sure why, but I know there are a few studies that, that um, try to understand how color follows the venation or the veins in the perian. Yeah. But I can maybe um, send you a few papers about it if you're interested. Great. So Olga, don't miss the chance and email her right away to get to know more about these wonderful patterns. The next question is by Swagatam and they are asking, uh, can you elaborate how this gene gives rise to specific colors? And he's curious to know the biochemical mechanisms. Okay. Yeah, so what we've seen is that the transcription factor um, kind of Okay, so it's kind of is a little bit more complicated, um, and this is not part of my thesis. This is more of what I've read from other papers. So the transcription factors actually um, activate the um, transcription of other genes. So these other genes are usually well the proteins or the enzymes that are inside the different path, uh, pathways, such as the flavonoid or the anthocyanin pathways. And these enzymes are like, um, like a chain and they produce different substrates and this chain goes on and on and on until you have a product that in this case is the anthocyanin, right? Um, Actually, the mid genes, when they activate the, the transcription of the enzyme genes, they do not work alone. So the mid gene has to form a complex that is com uh, composed of a mid gene, uh, a BHLH uh, transcription factor, and a uh, WDR protein. That complex sits on the gene, on the target gene. The transcript, the transcription occurs. You have your um, enzyme, and then the chain kind of starts. Then you have your molecule, which is the anthocyanin, and then the anthocyanin is usually um saved 
inside vacuoles. So they are uh, water soluble com uh, molecules and they are usually stored in the vacuum. So that's a little bit of how it works. Uh, I don't know if that was the answer you were looking for. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I guess it was pretty detailed. And if you have any more doubts, you can write in the chat box or get back to her. The next question is by Abe, and they're asking, how is a whole set of gene, I think he's talking about the specific uh, R2R3 gene, how is it absent in a particular family of the Aristotle Sorry, can you repeat the last part? Yeah, he is asking how is the whole set of gene absent in a particular family of uh, these flowers? How is it absent? Yeah, th that's the question. Okay, so how is it absent? Um, actually, the gene is probably there, but it's not expressing. So what we saw is that, for example, for Saruma that has yellow petals, so anthocyanins are related to colors such as purple, blue, pink, or red, but not yellow. So in these pe yellow petals, you don't expect to see a gene that is related to production of anthocyanin because it's yellow. So the gene is actually there. The plant has has this gene inside its genome, but it's not um, translating it into a protein um, because it, the anthocyanins are not needing, needed in this specific tissue. Um, but for example, in the same plant, you can find that that the the sepals or the leaves do have expression of the gene. So that uh, that means that the gene is, the plant does have the gene, but it, ex it chooses to express it in some parts of the plant, if that makes sense. I, I don't know if that was um, the question. Yeah, so Abi, if you have any further doubts, you, are, uh, you can feel free to write on the chat box. Mm -hmm. The next question is again a swagatam, and they're asking Is evolution of uh, Aristolosia related to the evolution of this certain gene or the gene expression mechanisms? Are they correlated? Oh, evolution gene expression. Well, <laughs> We thought at first that the ancestral kind of mode inside the Aristolochiasia was that like the ancestral color was yellow because Saruma, which is let's say the most basal uh, species or yeah, species inside the family um, is yellow. But you can find the color in in other species inside the family too. Um, so, for example, Aristolochia manchuriensis is also it has a yellow limb too. So, I don't think that there's like a lust or something like that that is related to the evolution. But as I said before, um, here, I don't know if you're seeing my my slides, but um, if you could relate the evolution to the genes, it's more like uh, to the number of genes. So, what we actually saw is that a uh, large scale duplication occurred and 
before the diversification of Asarum and Saruma, and that is what um, made this um, species inside this um, genera to have more copies. So that's a little bit of about, that's a little bit how I can relate the evolution to the genes. So the number of genes. Um, but of course, if you can look at the sequences, you could maybe spot a few differences. Um, so for example, uh, I told you that there was one, one copy in the in Asan Canadense that doesn't have expression and one that does. And in Saruma, there's one that has its expression in all the parts of the flower we evaluated. And actually, those copies in, in Asarum and Saruma that have ex expression in all the parts or developmental stages that we evaluated have a kind of uh, deletion in the gene. So sometimes it's, um, how the genes are performing can be related to uh, a few things that may have happened during evolution, like the loss of a few nucleotides. Cool. So I guess that was a very convincing answer, but if not, you can always reach out to her. The next question is, uh, with growth, one of the flowers seem to bend and get fused. Do you know anything about the mechanism of this process? Of the fusion of the samples, okay. Um, I know it happens kind of early in development, so they actually, um, so we have a few genera inside the family. So for the saru, uh, they actually have still remnants of the petals, uh, but the sepals are the ones that complete, completely develop. Um, for all the others, like Inora, Totea, and Aristolochia, only sepals are formed during development, and the fusion of those occur kind of early in the development of the flower and that's when and that's when for example in Aristolochia you start to see this whole structure as one coming together and forming this kettle like um, flower. But if you I don't know if you saw but in other genera such as Totea or Inora the sepals are not as fused as an in, in Aristolochia. So there are like different level, levels of fusion. I don't know if you could say it like that, but um, as some flowers fused, the sepals in some flowers fused more than in others. Cool. And um, these, these patterns are really interesting. And yeah. I hope, Swagatam, if you are more interested, you could actually do research on these and find out the answer yourself. So now we're running out of time, so I'll just take one more question. And this question, I hope everyone is very curious to know about, is how did the pandemic affect your research? And what, what did you do to, you know, work in the pandemic? And what tips would you like to give to those who are working on their projects and cannot access their labs. Okay, yeah. Well, I was kind of fortunate because when lock, lockdown started here in, in Colombia, um, I was in my last semester and I had already performed most of my experiments. Uh, so I was just like, gathering all the information and trying to understand the data um, and doing uh, more of like bioinformatics. Um, but 
uh, the access to the lab here was very, very, very restricted. So only like a few members of the lab could actually go and do some stuff and they had to take turns. What I could uh, say to you is if you don't depend on your experiments right now, try to start, uh, I don't know if you guys, I don't know if you guys um, have to write a manuscript too, but if you do, uh, I think it will be very, very uh, good if you start writing. If you don't have the, the data yet, you can start by, I don't know, reading papers, writing the introduction, maybe the methods. Um, and, um, yeah, that's, I don't have much um, advice because it was kind of easy for me, but I think take all this time and try to do as much as you can, I would say that. And also, was, while I was an undergrad, I didn't use Twitter, but I highly recommend you use Twitter because many PIs actually um, post like um, internship opportunities and PhD positions. So if you're looking to continue an academic or scientific career, it's a great, great, great way to find opportunities. So I think that's the biggest advice I could give actually, join Twitter. I know it sounds weird, but very valuable. <laughs> yeah. Indeed. And uh, Twitter was uh, very, really, really cool. And this is how I actually invited Sarita for our talk. So, guys, join Twitter. So, yeah, so I guess uh, we don't have any more questions. And even if we do, you can always forward it to her. And so, that's all for this evening. And thank you all for being here and making this event a possibility. And thank you so much Sarita, for coming here and presenting this very, very interesting and beautiful presentation. Thank you. And guys, we'll, uh, we'll let you know when the next meeting would be. And uh, that's about it for tonight. So we'll be ending the stream. See you guys.